uprisings all around the world, whether you're on the left or the right, this is the time to rise up and confront the government in places that you just wouldn't expect it. Hello there, you 6.4 million awakening wonders. Together we are on a voyage towards freedom. Together we are awakening. I sense that this is a time of great movement, of great power. Together we can change the world. We must begin to do it now. Turn on the notification bell immediately so you know every time we make one of these videos. Otherwise, what are you going to get? What the algorithm wants you watching, scrolling dumbly through the dross that will keep you hypnotized and controlled in the man-made manacles, in the algorithm-made cyber prison of the central centralized authoritarian establishment platforms that work with the deep state seems to have been proven by now. Even over in Iran, there are uprisings. Regardless of what your perspective is on the social and cultural issues within these individual nations, what we believe in is absolute freedom, absolute democracy, absolute dissolution of centralized power wherever possible. I spoke to Omid Jalili, the great English comedian and my friend, about the protests in Iran, how it's being covered by the media, how it's being used to mobilise censorship, you'll notice that everywhere in the world, the same thing seems to be happening. Hmm. You're here to tell me about what's going on in Iran, which I'm uh, ashamed to admit that other than the barest of bones, I don't understand at all, except there has been a kind of a feminist uprising that's somehow centred around, like, dress codes and the icons have emerged within this movement, and that it's not being reported on responsibly or nearly enough. Of course, on a platform like this one, we're always interested in how the media report or don't report on a subject, how the establishment exploits it, how certain narratives are promoted and other narratives are ignored and what the broader objectives would be of Western institutions towards Iran, who we know appeared on the sort of hit list of countries that should be destabilised post 9-11 and many of which have been destabilised since then. Uh, Iraq, of course, and Libya. So can you tell me what's been going on there and how it intersects with broader global narratives, I please? think what, what's very interesting is that he, as a stand-up comedian, what I did as soon as I saw what happened there was a 22 year old girl who was uh, they, they have these hijab laws where women have to wear hijab but in a certain way and I think a bit of her hair was showing so she was arrested she was supposed to be on some kind of hijab awareness course and they beat the crap out of her and she died and there, there are lots of flashpoints that happen in Iran but this was seismic we've had little kind of aftershocks where there's been uprisings but they've usually been quashed and the way they do it is by cutting the internet going and killing a lot of people and shutting everything down so this time we knew what was going to happen this was seismic and the first thing they did was shut the internet so through this thing called VPN, you can get a couple of videos out. If you join Telegram uh, channels, you can get a couple of videos. So those of us who were affected by it, and someone like me, I've been very involved in this whole thing for the last 44 years. We've had this crazy... Can you tell us why? Because I know like, you're English, but you have Iranian I'm, I'm heritage. A, I'm Iranian heritage. I'm also Baha'i. The Baha'i faith is a faith that is very much oppressed in the, uh, in the Islamic Republic. What The first thing they did, actually when the Islamic Republic came into being in 1979, they'd get rid of the Baha'is, shut women down. Uh, there was a woman called Shirin Abadi, who was a judge, who went to work. She goes, I was all for this, uh, this revolution. Then as soon as I showed up at work, they said, uh, you can go into janitorial or your receptionist. She goes, excuse me, I'm a judge. She goes, not anymore. All women can't do that kind of job. And she realized she'd been played. So, and also the Baha'i faith, which believes in the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, the unity and equality of men and women, they've got to go as well. So I've always been someone who's seen as a second class citizen in Iran and Baha'is are not allowed to have jobs. A lot of them were killed in the revolution. So this affected me in a very visceral way. So what I did was, okay, I thought, right, they've cut the internet. First thing I've got to do is be a voice for the people. And I did jokes about it because you've got the uh, supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, Khamenei, not Khomeini was the original one. Khamenei's cut the internet, but he's tweeting all the time. So he's got Wi-Fi and people go and they go and protest outside his house. And the state media says these are not pr pr protestations. People just trying to get a Wi-Fi hotspot. So I was doing things like, have you got, I've got two bars. What do you got? No, I've got one bar. You know, I've got no bars. You know, this reminds me when I used to live in Wigan. This is bullshit. <laughs> so we do jokes about it, but it's actually quite serious where they've cut the internet so they can just go and kill people. And now... There, there's an epidemic of executions where the men, the men have stood by the women. So it's a, it's a woman-led revolution. This is why it's amazing that we can't believe this is not being, it's not out there. It's the first time which, since the suffragettes we're seeing a woman-led revolution. And their main aim is to bring down the Islamic regime. 
So the, currently, uh, thank you, Amit. That sketched yeah. out some of the territory for me as a person that is uh, a woefully unfamiliar with this issue. Right. So Iran is currently governed by an Islamic state yes. type, as a Sharia law. Right. What was would ordinarily be termed an Islamic fundamentalist government yes. that and have been for forty four years. Forty four yeah. years, right? And low in the seventies, of course, famously Iran was becoming sort of somewhat more progressive. It and then was, the yeah. CIA got involved, shut that stuff down pretty sharp. There you go. Um, and then. Like so, like so. This though, so this on this occasion, there have been challenges. A female-led revolutionary movement. Well, uh, I'm surprised that that isn't with the sort of a uh, well-reported disdain that the West has for Arab nations, Middle Eastern territories, and Iran in particular. Why are the Western media and or Western interests not exploiting the opportunity to declare this is a progressive movement that's female? Led, which, by the way, I'd of course be fully in support of. Sure, uh, but you're why? not being told anything. You're not. You're not being shown anything. Why? I don't understand why. Well, this is what. This is the very big question. Is it, it's it, you know it's it's a it's a female-led uprising, and usually any kind of female-led uh, initiative is usually successful. So the first thing they do is obviously cut the internet, and we see very little in the Western press now. Why? I think that's the, whoops. Sorry about that. Okay. I wanted to get a pen. I wanted to take some notes. You're taking some notes. The question is why. And I think it's because they're trying to shut women down globally. So the first thing they're doing is anyone who speaks out against this revolution is deemed Islamophobic because this is a group of, this is how the Islamic people want to live their life. But actually most Iranians are saying, we never, we're, we're not an Islamic country. Iran was, was ruled by, we had the Persian empire with King Cyrus that believed in everyone should live together in harmony and unity. Then, Muslim, then Islam came over and they did it with, with rape and killing and forcing people to become uh, Islamic. But this is a certain interpretation of Islam. So now you have this very, you've got the government and you've got religion and the way they stay in power is by using religion to shut people down. So that's, that's what's happening. And, and what's interesting is the Western media don't, we've been trying to get the IRGC, the Islamic Republican Guard Corps, which is the group of military people which protects this Islamic regime, who are basically the mothership of all terrorism. If you see, on the, we're trying to get them on the terrorist list, but what you have is you've got Hezbollah, Hamas, these people, they're on the terrorist list, but they're all being funded by the Islamic Republican Guard Corps. It's like, not like an alien, the film Aliens, when Sigourney Weaver, and she goes and she sees the big mother laying all the eggs, and then she says, don't get away from her, you bitch, and she starts firing and things. IRGC, Islamic Republican Guard Corps, is that great big mothership of terrorism. Now, governments are not putting them on the on the terrorist list because they seem to have some kind of influence. We seem to be doing a lot of work with them. We're, we're financially entangled with them. So uh, the Iranian people are saying, the, oh, we're dealing with this revolution ourselves. But if you put the IRGC on the terrorist list, it gives it gives the people within the IRGC, within this military terrorist organization, it gives them an exit strategy. They'll leave, then the people of Iran will deal with Islamic regime the way they want to. Uh, this is a bit of coverage from Western media, albeit uh, Forbes, primarily a financial publication. Yeah. Uh, on 19th of May 2023, Iran executed three protesters following their convictions for the vague offence of Moharabeh, meaning an enmity against God, after trials yeah. that said to have violated due process and the right to a fair trial. Among the raised issues were concerns in relation to due process violations, significant procedural flaws, lack of evidence and torture, exactly. allegations that were never investigated. The, the intervention of of uh, Western nations in that territory is a sort of a long historic stain, whether it's yes. uh, the British Empire's involvement in those nations and territories and even the establishment of those territories and nations. In From a long time ago. That, that's why they don't like the Brits, because there was a coup in 1953, which they blamed the Brits and Americans, because they were there kind of saying, oh, you've got oil here, we'll help you get the oil mm. and we'll give you something. And then when they realised no money was coming to the Iranian people, they got rid of BP oil, they got rid of all the Brits. And then the Brits for $60,000, the Brits and the Americans, they did this coup and they took over again. So that's why they t that's why the people don't like the Brits. I mean, I'm sure people will write in saying they know what, they know what I'm talking about, but, the, but historically there's always been this thing that there's oil there and the West wants the oil. 
Also, people are saying that one of the organisations we can rely on for reporting on this are Grey Zone. We're friends with Aaron Matte and Max Blumenthal there. They um, sort of are w willing to report on issues that, generally speaking, get ignored by Western media. But what surprises me currently is that any instability in a Middle Eastern nation, and even the term Middle Eastern is, of course, by its nature, occidental and prejudicial, can be exploited by the type of Western interest that yeah, the needlessly uh, ex exploited the post-9-11 period to invade Iraq when it was completely tangential yes. and unrelated. So I'm, I'm surprised that we're not hearing about, uh, like, oh, we've got to support this revolution and instill some West-friendly government. Like, that's the kind of thing There's that... There's a lot of it going resonate. on online, but, the, but in, as far as the Western... Well, like, the, the 1979 Islamic Revolution, when they all came into power, was on, it was on TV all the time. I was a young 13-year-old, very much affected by it and felt that I was tarred with the same brush. The people at school saying, oh, you're an Islamic fundamentalist in it, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And it was on the news every single day. For anyone who's in their 50s who remembers that, it was on the news. This is not in the news at all. You see little bits online. You'll see a few people like myself. All the comedians I know who are like Iranian, they've all, we've all become activists now because we, we feel so much for what's going on, what's happening to the people of Iran, that they're basically being squashed and they're being killed, and there's like 30,000 people in prison, all just for protesting. Let me know in the chat in the comments what you thought of that conversation. Let me know whether it's the Canadian trucker protests, or the farm protests in Sri Lanka, or in the Netherlands, or indeed the Iranian protests. If you're noticing themes and similarities throughout the world when it comes to democracy, the lack of it, censorship, surveillance, and protest laws, let me know what you've noticed and what you've observed. Turn on the notification bell right now. If you enjoyed this video, have a look at either of these. We're back on Rumble from June the 5th. In the meantime, stay free.